Hello there, church. Coming to you with a pre recorded teaching from 1 Peter. I'm excited to be able to begin teaching through uh, the epistles of Peter. And uh, as you guys know, I'm in Saudi Arabia right now, and I'm pretty sure I will have sent you a video. I don't know exactly where we'll be. My, as of today, a week prior, uh, my tour guide brochure says, or the, the schedule says that we will be at the Red Sea or the Um Suf, where the crossing of the Exodus took place uh, on the Gulf of Aqaba. So very excited. Hopefully the video I sent you, I'm assuming I did get to send one. It was awesome. And you guys are eat up with gross jealousy because then we can fix that through 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me pray and we'll get into this lesson. We'll get into teaching systematically, line upon line, verse by verse through the first chapter of the epistle of 1 Peter. All right? Father, I thank you for my church. I thank you for any visitor present tonight. Thank you that we can pre-record things like this so that even in my absence, the church can still receive from my pastoral gifting and teaching gifting. Father, I ask you to anoint me to minister to your people tonight. Bless this message. Bless this service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So we're going to talk about 1 Peter chapter 1. And this is an epistle written, obviously, by Peter, written approximately 62, 63 A.D. We've just finished the epistle of James, and James was written approximately 20 or so years prior, about 45, 48 A.D., so 18 to 20 years prior. And Peter is writing, if you, if you want to turn quickly to 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll kind of read the footnotes or the endnotes. Peter is writing this epistle, we'll, we'll begin reading in verse 12, um, by Silvanus. That means his disciple Silvanus um, is actually the scribe transcribing this epistle, which was often a very common practice. Uh, by Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly. So the implication is I've written this epistle by the hand of Silvanus as I dictated it, Peter speaking, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you. So that is an inference that he is writing from Babylon. But every commentary I've read, every footnote I've read, says that everybody believes that he's not writing from what we would call Iraq or Babylonia, but from actually Rome. This is what the early church referred to Rome, or Rome, Italy, the capital of the Roman Empire. They referred to that as Babylon. And everybody, all the historians, all the theologians seem to be in agreement. Peter was not in Babylon or modern-day Baghdad, Iraq, writing this. He's actually in Rome. And he's writing this, and he evidently has a church there. We know when Paul writes the Roman epistle, the epistle to the Roman believers, he's never been to Rome. And that's what he says in the Roman epistle. I hope to come to you. I hope to basically meet you one day. That lets us know that it was Peter that more than likely established the Roman church. But he says uh, the church that's here at Babylon, which really is kind of telling you who the whore of Babylon is and why a lot of folks believe the Pope and Rome and the Catholic church is the whore of Babylon and the Babylonian system. But it lets you know how they viewed Rome at the time, the, the mother of all whoredoms. Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter has a church there. He's saluting them from that church. Silvanus has written the epistle. And he also says, uh, not only do they greet you, but so does Marcus, my son. Marcus, my son. That would be a reference to John Mark. So if you know the story, the backstory of John Mark, he went with Paul originally to be a missionary when Barnabas and Paul set out from uh, Antioch to be baby missionaries, they had John Mark as their servant. And he didn't last very long because he was a rich boy and didn't like being a servant, probably didn't like being on the high seas and certainly didn't like doing laundry. So he quits. The good news is he was able to come back at some point and repent and take up ministry with Peter. And so he's not Paul's son in the faith, though it would seem to appear he was meant to be Paul's son in the faith, but at least he hung around Jerusalem, which we know where Peter operated in and out of. <clears throat> and it would appear that Peter was able to take him under his wing and make a spiritual son 
out of them. That's, that should bring us hope that no matter what we've goofed up, messed up, or exploited, or wasted, if our heart will repent, God will make a, a way. God will make a, a condition. God will make an allowance for us to come in and still run our race. Now, then the question arises, was that the perfect will of God or was that just a nice close second place? Me personally, God is, I believe God is very merciful, as I know you believe, but I also believe that there are windows of opportunity that have to be hit and that you only get one life to live, one destiny to perfectly fulfill, and you can't just keep squandering things and wasting time. And, and no matter how soft or tender or regretful you are in your heart, if you don't put forth the effort, you're not going to finish your race on time. I personally believe, and you can disagree because this is, it's neither here nor there. And I, I base this not only on scripture, but also from experiences of men older than me coming to me, sharing with me their personal testimonies. I personally believe, looking at John Mark, he was supposed to be with Paul and Barnabas. And I believe Paul and Barnabas were supposed to stay together. And yet there was a fragment there. And John Mark returns and kind of plays mama's boy for a little bit. At some point, though, we know he does repent. But Paul is gone. Paul is out traveling the world. And Peter should have been with them. Excuse me, uh, John Mark should have been with them. But he wasn't. He's back in Jerusalem. And maybe some kind of sorrow, grief, regret set upon him. <clears throat> he repents in his life and he takes up under the apostle Peter and God grafts him to Peter, though I believe probably he should have been grafted to Paul the whole time. Now, remember, Paul, by the Holy Ghost at the end of his life, says in 2 Timothy, send John Mark to me now, for he's profitable to me. Well, wasn't he supposed to be profitable to you from the beginning? Why is he just now profitable to you at the very end of your life? So to me, that, that seems to be like a divestment or a departure. He takes up with Peter. Here's Paul over here. And then near the end of his life, after tutelage and tutoring and discipling under Peter, he's able to come back and maybe pick up where he was, should have been for 20, 25 years with Paul. All that to say, all that's conjecture on my part. All that to say is John Mark became Peter's son in the faith and was with Peter in Rome. It just took a lot longer to learn how to travel and be a missionary than maybe it should have. But thank God, maybe the bright side is he got it. He made the adjustment. And maybe what our takeaway is, no matter what, we can learn to make the adjustment. It's never too late to repent and find some horsepower, find some, some guts under the hood and go on with God in a deeper, more fervent, more passionate way. I do remind you, we live in the upper Cumberland, which is neck deep in laziness and religion. And those two ideologies and spirits wash over us and make us pretty lazy and useless. So we got to resist it. And let's start into 1 Peter now. With 1 Peter... Now we know the setting, Second, uh, seven, uh, 62, 63 AD, writing from Rome. This is the reign of Nero, the, one of the very wicked uh, emperors or Caesars, C Caesar Nero. And Rome's called Babylon. Peter evidently is there. He has a church there. Maybe he is the one that established the Roman church. That's what the Catholics believe. He believed he was the first pope. And Peter is writing this. For our teaching, I'm going to back, uh, bounce back and forth between King James and New Living Translation. Most of you read King James anyway. We'll have New Living Translation on the Chevron. That's what's going to be appear on the screen, the banner <clears throat> below me. So you don't have to worry about turning there unless you want to. So let's start in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, if I read again to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, this ought to instantly remind you of how James' epistle began. So let's read that real quick because we see that they're accomplishing the same thing. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Peter says it a little bit more specifically, to the strangers, not the 12 tribes, but to the strangers throughout, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So what's our setting here? 62, 63 AD, Babylon, 
that's Rome, is headed by Caesar Nero. And now we're still addressing strangers scattered throughout what is now Turkey. This is Asia Minor. When you look at these cities or regions, these are all regions, by the way, Pontus, or Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. This is all the bulk of central to eastern Turkey. Um, Istanbul is further, well, if you're looking at your map, here's Istanbul over here coming over into Greece. Here is uh, the Aegean Sea right here. Here's Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Bithynia. They're all this region right here. And then here's western, excuse me, eastern Turkey before you get into what is that, northern Syria. Um, so he's talking about basically if you come straight down, now you hit the Israeli and the Lebanese coast. So the Lebanese and um, Israeli coast on the Mediterranean goes straight up through Antioch into this region. So he's referring once again to the Jewish believers, the strangers. Why are they strangers? Because they're originally from Israel, but now they've been scattered into what is Asia Minor, or we would call it modern-day Turkey. And he's writing to them. And the theme of all of 1 Peter is basically living as a Christian under persecution and suffering. That's the entire theme of the epistle. There is some Christology in there. There is some soteriology in there. But one of the things we're going to see over and over again is how to live clean and holy and live as a Christian and renew our soul and fight the good fight, even though we're suffering and we're suffering and we're suffering. And one of the things it, it shows me is that it doesn't matter where you or I may find ourselves, no matter where the body of Christ, Christ may find itself, whether in a prison cell, whether under persecution, which these were, but not necessarily by Rome itself yet. Uh, the real Roman persecution ramped up at the beginning of the third century, like 230, 240. Um, and that emperor's name escapes me. He was the most horrific of all the persecutors of the believers. But what this epistle does lend itself to saying to us is, it doesn't matter where you or I will ever find ourselves in this life, we're still called and expected to live clean and holy and to demonstrate the love and the, the power of Jesus Christ. We don't get exceptions. We don't get passes. Just because our life is hard doesn't exempt us from this, the expectation that we're to be like Jesus Christ. So I want you to keep that in mind. The whole of the epistle is you're scattered abroad, you're suffering. Take up in you the sufferings of Christ and be a good Christian. There is no there, there now. Come to daddy, let daddy hold you. There, there now. Come to pastor, let pastor hold you. There really isn't a lot of what we'd call outright modern day American ministerial encouragement. It's like, yeah, things are tough. It's good for you. <laughs> In fact, we're going to see that here pretty quickly. Let's move on to verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Here's where we begin to pick up verses that do lend themselves towards predestination. The term elect there is electos, which means to choose. The inference in the Greek is that you choose based on a criteria. Paul also calls it the election of grace. All right, grace. So God is choosing people. Yes, we agree. God chooses. Many are called, few are chosen. But Paul also gives us the caveat. Why does God or how does God choose people? It's the choosing according to grace. Okay, great. How do you get grace? He gives grace to the who? Humble. So if you and I want to be elected, and this is where I differ with the Calvinists and maybe frustrate them in my interpretation, but to me, it's pretty simple. If you want to be selected by God, humble yourself because he gives grace to the humble and then he selects those that have grace. And again, to tilt the Calvinist mind, grace is merited. <laughs> of course, that defies the definition of grace being unmerited favor. God gives you favor. It's unmerited. I'm not even sure if I agree with that definition much anymore, which some might consider heresy. But if the Bible commands us, follow my logic here, because I'm not trying to be a heretic. I'm just trying to follow logic and reason based on Scripture. If the Bible commands us to humble yourself, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, then it stands to reason if we're commanded to humble ourselves, then we 
can humble ourselves. Mom and dad taught us how to do that. Boy, fix that attitude. I'm going to fix it myself. You better walk. Well, I've, I heard many times, you better walk, uh, wipe that smirk off your face, boy. Well, these were commands to change attitude and behavior, and it was, could be done. So if God says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You humble yourself. That means I can and I must and I'm required to. So, all right, Lord, I humble myself. Then the Lord says, again, it's the same Lord. He's not schizo. The same Lord says, I give grace to the humble. Oh, wait, so I humbled myself? So I just positioned myself for God's grace. Well, he couldn't give me the grace until I obeyed the commandment. What was the commandment? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. All right, he gives grace. And then he selects people according to grace that he's given. Humble yourself, this first Peter, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you. Hum humility, which is our responsibility, causes God or enables God or permits God, whatever word least offends you, enables God or allows God to exalt us in due season. Not our season, his season. So follow again. It's an election according to grace. Grace comes through humility. He giveth more grace to the humble. All I have to do to obtain grace is to humble myself. And then his election or his selection is activated in my life because God's going to resist the proud, but select and use the humble. Every leader in a church gets this. We resist the arrogant people and we use the humble people. We sit the arrogant ones down. We promote the humble ones. And if the arrogant repent and their heart turns, we're able to then bring them up. And yet we as a local church and the body of leaders, we represent God and we're a reflection of what his Holy Spirit is trying to do. So elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Yes, he knew in advance because he is omnipotent and knows all things. Through sanctification of the Spirit, I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago and his Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have and been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. By the blood of Jesus Christ, may God give you more and more grace and peace. <clears throat> this is where I like the King James. It says, um, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading. Blessed be God, uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. We have been begotten again unto a lively hope. Now we're going to see a lot of terms played with back and forth. Faith and hope. Faith and hope. And I want to define this very clearly. Faith is now. Faith is our trust in God now. Hope is different. Faith is now. Faith is presently what we're believing in this moment called the now. It's what we're standing and believing God for. Hope, the term hope means expectation. And honestly, in the Hebrew context and the Hebrew language, the best way to explain hope is future faith. And the term is somewhat used interchangeably. I don't want to get too much into etymology, but um, the Hebrew word for hope and faith are used interchangeably. The Greek concept of hope is an uncertain good. Uh, the wanting of an uncertain good, like we would use it. I hope we win. I hope this doesn't happen. It's, it's a wanting of an uncertain good. Paul, when he uses the Greek word, actually applies the Hebrew understanding that it's a future expectation. It's a, this is what I expect to happen. That's important because we can't read King James or the New Testament and see hope and put upon it our American understanding, which is, I hope we win the championship. I hope I get this for Christmas. I hope so-and-so wins the presidency. Because what that is is a voiced concern for an uncertain good, and it's uncertain. Hope in Christ is not uncertain. Hope in God is not uncertain. So hope is future. It's a future expectation. Christ in us the hope of glory. Christ in us, the expectation of glory. But now is faith. Now faith is. That's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now. So we're going to see faith and hope back and forth. And hopefully you catch all that. Sometimes that takes a little bit of time to wrap your mind around. He has begotten us again into a lively hope. Now I want to focus on begotten us. 
begotten us. The New Living Translation says he's caused us to be born again. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again or begotten again unto a lively hope, a lively expectation by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We were, quote Romans 7 here, maybe it's Romans 6, Romans 7. We were alive once unto God. The law came, quoting Paul, the law came, sin revived, and we died. That's what Paul said. But we didn't die physically. Paul didn't die physically when he wrote that. He was writing it. I was alive once. That means alive unto God. But the law came, sin revived, and I died. How did you die? Well, you rebelled against the law of God, and it was rebellion, and it caused a spiritual death. That's why Jesus came along in John 3 and said, you must be born again. First Peter 2 goes on here in a moment to talk about being born again. Or into chapter 1, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, the Word of God. We've been begotten again through the new birth. That means our body has stayed the same, but our insides are brand new. The spirit man, the, 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 the divine, I don't want to say divine, the eternal part of us that lives forever has been begotten again. So we get a restart, a fresh reboot. It's called salvation, but we've been begotten again into a lively hope. We're no longer hopeless. We no longer have an expectation of eternal damnation. We have an expectation of hope in Christ or an expectation of eternal salvation. Why or how? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And part of that expectation, which unfortunately is lost on us because we have focused so much on heaven and, and passing away, and I don't know how to get this back into us or if it's even important to us. I think it's so far removed from our minds what Paul often refers to as that glorious hope is not heaven, though that's part of the package deal. Titus even refers to that glorious hope. It's the resurrection of the dead, the expectation, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's, that's the glorified body. And some of you may not agree with that. You may not even see it. But in studying this over and over and over and over again, the main message, Paul even uh, testified of it when he was on his own defense council. He says, of the resurrection of the dead, do I stand in judgment of you today? One of the key points of their message and one of the things the Jews who converted to Christianity were preaching and teaching was that we will all be resurrected from the dead. We will not all sleep. We will not all have these bodies that are dead and in the ground. We're going to be resurrected from the dead. So I want us to understand that New Testament concept is that we're going to have a new body, and that's called the hope, the hope of glory, having a new body one day. And that's wonderful. As one theologian pointed out, the Bible is not content with a bodiless eternity. Yes, we die and we go to heaven. And maybe American Christianity or the modernist Christianity, we've only focused on, and maybe it's through our salvation lingo and our evangelistic lingo. Do you know where you're going to die? Where you're going to go when you die? Do you know where you're going to go where you die? Do you know where you're going to... If you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? And that totally omits the whole promise of a resurrected body, which is part of our salvation. We get born again in our spirit. We get sanctified in our soul. We get a glorified body. And that's probably a discussion for another day. But I want you to see a, we have a lively hope. He's begotten us again into a lively hope. And it's no mistake that he references the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead because the hope they understood was not the faith of now, but the resurrection of the dead that was to come. Let's keep reading. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, I love it. Our, our lively hope doesn't just include eternity with Christ. It doesn't just include a glorified body. It includes a divine, sacred inheritance that's incorruptible. It's not like mom or dad's inheritance. It's not like acreage or a car or a shotgun that's going to rust in your closet. It's a divine, sacred inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, cannot fade away, and it's reserved in heaven just for us. Us, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith. Now, again, the context is the strangers scattered from their home territory into Asia Minor, Turkey. And he's not really encouraging them and giving them hugs about their hardship. He's reminding them of the eternal truths 
that should be sustaining them and reminding them, listen, it's a rough time, but you have an inheritance. Just keep pressing on. And then verse 5 comes along and it begins to set up this warning and this encouragement. Kind of like you, you're running a race. You got five more miles. Don't quit now. It's tough. You hurt. There's a stitch in your side. You're a little dehydrated. Your muscles are cramping, but you've been running 20 miles. Make it five more. Finish your race. He says this, you believers, you strangers scattered abroad, you were kept by the power of God through faith. Kept by the power of God through faith. He just covered hope. That's the hope of the resurrection. That's future. What about now? Right now, you strangers, you're kept by the power of God through faith. So hope of the resurrection is future tense. The inheritance to come is future tense. But right now, your faith keeps the power of God working. You who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Let me read it to you in the New Living Translation. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. Now, here's what I want to emphasize. What happens if we shut the faith off? We've been taught for decades, faith is a muscle. We develop it. We exercise it. We apply it. We flex it. What happens if we turn faith off? What happens if we get a little lethargic? What happens if we start to back off our spiritual training? What happens if we're like, I don't know if I want to go to church anymore. I don't know if I want to read my Bible anymore. You eventually begin to lose muscle and you don't even realize it. Dumb example, but it fits. Prior to COVID with my little workout group, some of you used to attend it. We've kind of dried up through this winter. Prior to COVID and even through the first year of COVID till all of a sudden they got afraid we might get sick working out outside. We were able to work out at the stadiums at Tech, Tech campus here. And that involved a lot of stadium runnings, just running up and down steps, up and down steps, up and down steps. And there's three little platforms, two sections, and we do push-ups at one section, run up to the next steps, do air squats, run up to the next step, do flutter kicks, run back down, and just do that for 45 minutes. And then COVID hits, and our university here, in precautionary sake, drank from the stupid wells, and they shut it down because they didn't want anybody to get sick working out outside, even though the made-up number of the CDC was six feet of separation, and that was social distancing, which we did in queues at airports, and then we got on an airplane and set elbows to armpits with the person next to us. I mean, if there's anything we learned the last four years of this nation, nobody really who claims they believe in science actually believes in science. I've never seen such mastery of scientific retardation affect a civilization. But then again, I'm only not even 50 years old, but what a joke. Anyway, so we were then banned politely from working out on the stadiums. And we continued to work out. It was great. We continued to work out in the parking lot. Nobody's bugged us. We went from running stadiums to just running and doing lunges and what have you. And then recently we were able to get back in and start running stadiums. And, and we started running stadiums for the first time in three and a half years. And we all realized what incredible shape we were in before we quit. And even though we maintained fitness, our fitness had radically declined because we could no longer run those stadiums with such rapid succession. So my point is this. You don't realize how strong you've built your faith until you back off and then all of a sudden you need it again. So let's never back off. Let's never back off whatever we're doing to train our faith. Let's not have our strongest days behind us. Let's have our strongest days yet in front of us because we just keep climbing. Let me come back to this verse. We're kept by the power of God through faith. If we turn off our faith, we turn off the power of God. And if we turn off the power of God, he's not able to keep us and maintain us until the day of salvation that is ready to be revealed. This verse is telling us we're not going to see the hope of the resurrection if we shut our faith off. Once again, we have here a verse that seems to undermine a once saved, always saved mindset. If we don't maintain the faith, we don't maintain the power. And if the power isn't maintained, we can't be kept ready for the salvation to be revealed. Verse 6, that salvation, I'm going to imply it here, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, 
you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, that's definitely an anti-word of faith verse. And in fact, I didn't ever hear it taught in the Word of Faith revival because it says, if need be, you are in heaviness. Now, this is a reference to the persecutions that the scattered strangers are experiencing. But he doesn't offer a hug or a consolation. He says, it probably is necessary. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't like that interpretation. I don't like that application. You mean to tell me, Apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Ghost, I can rejoice even though it might be necessary for me to be heavy through manifold temptations? And that word temptations doesn't just mean uh, sinful temptations, but it's also tests and trials. Verse 6 says, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. Well, so be truly glad. Shut up, Peter. <laughs> there is wonderful joy ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. The last 30 years of Christianity seems to have been an escapist pipe dream. How to have your best Tuesday ever, how to dream a little dream, command God to bless it, and how to click your heels and believe you don't receive heartache. And if you're going through heartache, just be a lunatic and act like it's not happening. But here we have true biblical orthodoxy telling us it may need be. You're going through the rough go and it's good. So suck it up and be joyful. Rejoice with joy unspeakable. Verse 7, I'm going to keep now in the New Living Translation. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. Now that's the same faith that's keeping the power of God active that we might be kept secure waiting salvation. If we never go through anything... We never know how strong our faith needs to be. <laughs> Coming back again to our, my physical training, I've never wanted to be a huge muscular guy. I don't want to have to maintain that mass. I've always wanted just to have exceptional cardio and physical endurance because in all my travels, I always end up someplace with a mountain and I want to climb it. Same with me being gone right now. Uh, I think Thursday or Friday is when we actually get to summit. Uh, Jebel el which is the Mount Sinai. It's 2,000 feet of elevation gain. So for the last couple of weeks, I've been training with a weight vest, running stadiums or stairs and going for three and four mile runs to keep my cardio up. And this climb is going to show me how strong my cardio is. And you better believe I'm going to be judging everybody on that hike, seeing how good they are. And I'm going to be condemning them in my heart. And I'm going to say, you probably didn't work out hard enough for this. Yeah, walking two miles a day at sea level is not the same as climbing 2,000 feet at 6,000 feet, 7,000 feet. You don't know what you're capable of till you put yourself to the test. Pastor Vaughn used to say you can't build a house in a hurricane. And the implication was you're always building because one day the hurricane's coming. Brother Hagen would have said it this way, whatever you're not up on or upon, you're down on. So we have to always maintain our faith for healing, maintain our faith for forgiveness, maintain our faith for uh, provision, maintain our faith for holiness, because at some point, one of these is going to come under attack. Peter says, these trials that we have to go through, they're good for us because they show that our faith is genuine. They'll prove our faith. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. I like the idea right now when I'm not under a trial. I like the idea of a trial because it tests my faith. And as I share or use the example, it shows us where our system leaks. Think of your faith as a bunch of uh, sprinkler system pipes or plumbing pipes that are supposed to hold water. And before they ever charge, they call it charging a system. Before they ever charge the system, they'll run air through it. And they'll pressurize it. They'll put an air meter on it. And they'll let it sit and see if, if you charge it to, I'm going to make up a number here. They charge it to 200 PSI. And they put a pressure meter on it. And they walk away. They come back the next day. If it's dropped down to 50 PSI, they know there's a leak somewhere. If they charge it to 200 PSI, they come back the next day and it's still at 200 PSI, they know that that system is watertight, literally. They can then charge it with water from the fire he header and it won't leak anywhere. 
These tests and trials show us where our systems have leaks. And as Brother Hagen, excuse me, Brother Sumrall has said, we keep quoting him a lot lately, wherever your mind screams the loudest is where your faith is the weakest. We would say, wherever your mind goes, that's where your faith is the weakest. These trials always bring that out of us. My question would be, are we, are we passing trials going on to new trials or do we keep facing the same old trials? Because at some point you pass the trial and even if it comes back, it's no big deal to you anymore. You don't even see it as a trial. You're just like, huh? It becomes part of your background noise. But if the trial is still a trial and it's the same trial for 10 years, then you haven't grown any and your faith is still weak. Think of it again, working out. Um, maybe let's just talk about a bench press. No, an air squat, not air squat, a squat, rack squat. So you put weight on your shoulders and you squat. Actually, it's really sore because I just ran yesterday with a weight vest and my legs are tired. Right there. Uh, that's probably how a lawn squats, 135 right there. Oh, and those chicken legs of his. <laughs> At some point, 225 is the trial of your faith on a squat. And it, you're straining and you got your buddy spotting you, maybe two guys on the side, and it's all you got. And boy, you squat it, you cheer, you hurt yourself, but man, you, you, you passed it. Well, if you're going to go beyond that, you're going to also keep squatting 225. And before long, you're up to 255, 285, 305. Now you're squatting 315, 375. But to warm up, you still got to start at 225. So what was once a trial for you in a bit, uh, air squat or squat, weighted squat, what was once your trial and your biggest accomplishment now becomes your warm-up weight? Same with life. Whatever these trials are, they're never going to go away, but they just don't affect you anymore because your faith has grown and can master it. And so you wake up in the morning and what used to be the biggest thing you faced in your entire life, now you deal with that for five minutes before you get to work and you don't think anything of it because you've grown. And that's why these trials are necessary. Let's keep reading because I have a lot to cover still. Verse eight, you love him even though you have never seen him. I'm in the New Living Translation. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with glorious, inexpressible joy. Uh, King James loves it. Whom having not seen you love and whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And now he's actually acknowledging the heartache that they're going through. That yes, it's a tough trial, but your trial is being, uh, your, your trial is testing your faith. Your faith is of much more uh, value than precious gold that perishes. And the reason we can endure these trials is because we love him, though we don't see him. And because we love him, even in the midst of a trial, we can rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And verse 9 says, the reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Now, that doesn't just mean eternal salvation. That's the word suke there, sozo of suke. But the salvation of your souls is stability of mind, will, and emotions. The reward for trusting him, how about we say it this way? The reward for trusting him will be the stability, the grounding, the establishment of your mind, your will, and your emotions. 225 no longer intimidates me. It's what I throw on to warm up. And I just squat it all day long. Before long, it's what I'm going to bench press. And then it's what I'm going to warm up on bench pressing. The salvation of our souls is stability in our mind, stability in our emotions, stability in our wants. That's something we need to aim for. Let's keep reading. I'm going to continue the New Living Translation. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this glorious salvation prepared for you. That might be an interesting study to go find. Somebody's already done it. You just got to start researching it. All the different prophecies that talk about the salvation you and I get to walk in today. Peter's alluding to the fact that the prophets of old, they were looking into this and they were excited about it. Verse 11 says, they wondered what time 
or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. So can you imagine being an Old Testament prophet, prophesying the Psalms, prophesying the major prophets, prophesying maybe in the history books, and prophesying about Christ dying, the Messiah dying, the Lamb of God, and the the fruit, the rewards, the glorious rest that Isaiah talks about. And you're wondering as a prophet, what am I even talking about here? What does this even mean? They're wondering. And verse 12 tells us, they were told by God that their messages were not for themselves, but for you and I. It's pretty powerful to think about our heroes of the Bible prophesied stuff they never got to realize, but we realize it. They prophesied stuff they never got to see, but we get to walk in it. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Now here's the encouragement that is finally being offered to the saints who are being persecuted and a great trial of afflictions who, that Peter calls the manifold temptations and the trial of your faith. It isn't come here and give Papa a hug or let Daddy give you um, a kiss and pat you on the head. The encouragement is this. You're walking out stuff other people never got to walk out. <laughs> you get to live out stuff angels are curious about. Yeah, you're being persecuted. Yeah, you're not in Jerusalem anymore. But you're getting to live in a day that the prophets long to see and you live it for real. So that's about as much encouragement as they get through their heartache and their hardship. Because, as Brother Hagin said, if we're born again, we're well able. Well able to what? Do whatever needs to be done. Grow up, dress up, spirit up, and press on. So because these angels and these prophets, prophets wanted to see what we're living, angels are still eagerly watching these things. Look at how verse 13 transitions. So think clearly and exercise self-control. So think clearly and exercise self-control. Self-control is a staunch New Testament doctrine. Self-control. I wrote a book about it. Not a very good seller at all. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Why would it be? We live in a hedonistic nation where there, where anything, how did I say it before? If it gets in the way of you and pleasure, you don't consider it love. If it gets in the way of you and fun, it's not considered love. Self-control gets in the way of you and pleasure and self-control gets in the way of you and love. Therefore, we reject self-control like it's from the pit of hell. But here we have a command. Think clearly. Why? Angels are watching. Think clearly. Why? You're getting to live out something prophets could only prophesy about. And walk in self-control. Why? Because you're born again and you've got the Holy Ghost. And I'm sure the angels, because we don't see it like they do, angels who've been in existence and have been helping mankind since the fall, they could see people serving God before the resurrection and they can see people serving God after the resurrection, and these before the resurrection, they were all dead spiritually. There was no light emanating from their innermost being because they were dead to God. Because remember, that's what Peter just said. We've been begotten again into a lively hope. Lively, not dead religious hatchet face. Me dumb, dumb, no fun, fun. Begotten again into a lively hope. Now the angels, after the resurrection of Christ, they begin to see believers ignite on the inside with some kind of spiritual light, So they're like, whoa, okay, we get it now. They pray this prayer of salvation. They, by faith, they call out on the name of Jesus and this new light of God is kindled on the inside of them. Whoa, what a species of being that's never existed. What does this even mean? They're trying to figure this thing out. And yet, how is it that on this side of Calvary, we're less self-controlled and squirrelier than we've ever been? On this side of Calvary with the new birth, we ought to be really clear in our thinking and very disciplined in our bodies. And that's what was the essence of my book, Fat, Broken, Crazy, was about. Getting a hold of your mind, getting a hold of your body, getting a hold of your money. And yet here in America, we're debt indebted, we're crazy, and we're fat. And I don't say that to condemn anybody, 
Just another challenge. Obey this verse and watch your life change. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. And what did verse 13 just say? Think clearly, live self-controlled. Think clearly, exercise self-control. Verse 14, you must live as God's obedient children. Do you see it? Think clearly and exercise self-control. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Now, maybe to you, self-control is not an obesity thing. Maybe it's a lust thing. Maybe it's a spending thing. Maybe it's a gossip thing. Maybe it's an entertainment appetite. But whatever it is, Peter says, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Here's why I want to jump back to the King James. King James says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust. Now, fashioning yourselves is the Greek word I teach from time to time, sukamatizo, which is where through the Latin we get the term schematic. Now, schematic is like a blueprint. So he's saying, obey your God. Don't obey the old schematic. Obey the new blueprint in the word of God. Obey the new blueprint in the spirit. Don't obey the old blueprint. We're designing, excuse me, we're building going forward and we will always build according to the blueprint in front of us. All of us dads in this church have enjoyed Lego blueprints. And if we have these bags of Legos, as you dads know how they come, but we're given the wrong blueprint, we're going to start putting together the wrong thing, even though the parts are designed to build a TIE fighter or a Batmobile or whatever. If you're given the wrong blueprint, you're going to use the right pieces to build the wrong thing. And what should be a TIE fighter comes out as a Barbie dream house, but very gray. <laughs> or if you're supposed to be building a Barbie dream house, it comes out as a very pink Batmobile. Assuming all the pieces are the same. Give me some leeway on this example here. What blueprint, what schematic are you building your life on? Do you look like the world? Does anything about your life, your body, your money, your mind, your marriage, does any of it look like the world? Because if so, what we've done is we've slipped back into our own way and we've not received the schematic of God's word. See, this is the same thing as Romans 12. Be not conformed to this world. That's the word sukumatizo. Don't build after the world's pattern. Build after God's pattern. Verse 14, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. And now obviously the, the ignorance has been stripped from us. But now you must be holy in everything you do just as God who chose you is holy. What a high calling. What a, what a, a demand placed upon us. I don't hear a lot of teaching on this outside of maybe holiness circles. Can you imagine standing up in a seeker church and saying, you must be holy in everything you do, even as your God is holy. You don't build a mega church with a message like that. You build a mega church telling people how to have their best day ever and giving them authorization to build according to their schematic. But Peter says, we must be holy. Now we must be holy. How you view food must be holy. How you view money must be holy. How you view sex must be holy. How you view music and entertainment must be holy. This, everything you do leaves nothing out. But because God is in us and we've been begotten again into a lively hope, he can place that kind of demand on us. The scriptures say, verse 16, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember, verse 17, that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. King James says, without respect of persons, judges according to every man's work. Now, we know he has favors. That's why I a little disagree here with the NLT's translation. The angels declared peace on earth, goodwill toward men, or as that's King James, modern translations say, peace on earth to whom God favors. Peace on earth to whom God favors. His loving kindness, his favor, 
shines upon not all, but to some. So it's trying to say he has no favorites. What he's really saying is he's going to judge everybody regardless of who you are. But you and I both know he has favorites today because those are the people that have his grace. And those who are stubborn and belligerent, he resists. They're not his favorites. He loves them. He died for them. He wants to fellowship with them, but they're not his favorites. He's not favoring them. That aside, keep reading. He will judge and reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land. New Living Translation puts foreigners in the land in, I, in a quotes. Foreigners in the land. That's a double-folded meeting, a double-edged meeting here. Foreigners in the land. Number one, these are those that have been scattered abroad into Asia Minor. So they're foreigners up there. But we also know as Father Abraham, he was a sojourner in Canaan when he was from Ur the Chaldees. So the, the, the second reference is we're in this world, but we're not of it. We're, we're strangers in this land. And as long as we're strangers in this land, because we're not of it, then we must live our lives in reverential fear of him during our time. If you and I would live our lives in reverential fear of him, our faith would never grow cold. Now, having said that, just pause for a second. Think about everything we've said so far walking through this chapter. He's acknowledging you're strangers, you're scattered abroad, you've been begotten again unto a lively hope, you have an inheritance incorruptible. These are carrots in front of the sheep to not back down. And then he says, verse 5, you're kept by the power of God through faith, ready. And there's a trial of your faith. So be strong and you rejoice and you're going to receive the end of your faith, which is a steady soul. And you're living a life that others long to look into. So don't fail. You can see that everything he's saying is going towards don't let your dispersion in the diaspora don't let that dispersion, don't let the persecution cause you to shrink back. We're seeing these exhortations of not, oh, they're there. Let me give you a hug. The exhortation, the, the word to these scattered believers is don't retreat. Don't back down. Yes, you find yourself in a place you don't want to be, but you still have to serve God and you can't quit now. And th this is a severe epistle. And I think it should be coming into focus for us uh, and, and the reality of it ought to sink in that no matter where we are, what we're going through, we're still required to honor God and serve him. Well, let's try to land this message now. We're running out of time here. Got a couple verses left. We're foreigners in this land. We must live in reverential fear of him during our time. Verse 18. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. Now, there's two applications there. Number one, we know he's addressing Jews. So Peter's totally ripping on Judaism in this translation. God redeemed you to save you from empty life you inherited from your ancestors. The emptiness of Judaism, the emptiness of ritual, the emptiness of Talmudic Judaism that made a wall to prevent people from sinning against the law of Moses. We've been redeemed from that. But what if we apply that closer to home? It becomes kind of a knock or an insult against the culture we were given. I think most of us could look at where we come from, and though there's good things, just like Judaism had good things, we could admit we've, emptied, uh, we, we've inherited some empty things from our ancestors. Some of us have been given an empty social inheritance, and we have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb to be redeemed from that empty inheritance. Maybe pause for a second and think in your own life, what has my empty inheritance been? What am I defending voraciously when truth be told it's cheap tin? It's cheap pot metal. It's not gold. It's not silver. It's not worthy. There's, there's always an inheritance. There's always a culture that was worthy. But a lot of what we've been given, we have to be able to point out what's hollow, what's empty. You have been saved from, uh, by God to say, excuse me, redeemed or ransomed to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but he has now revealed him to you 
in these last days. That kind of completes this cycle, this, this cyclic thought, cyclical thought of the prophets and the angels long to look into this. And this says, and, and he was chosen. Jesus was jo- chosen before the foundation of the world, but it's just now been revealed to you. And the prophets and the angels want to look into it. So let's not fail them. Let's live clean. Let's have a disciplined mind. Let's exercise self-control so we can demonstrate what this promise and this grace is supposed to do in our lives. It, it would really be a shame for Old Testament believers who didn't know the, old, uh, the new birth, who didn't have the Holy Ghost like we do. It'd be a shame for them to be able to accomplish more in their lives than we can in ours. Now we're the temple. Now we're the tabernacle. Now we're the priesthood. Now we're the kingship. Now we're the lively stone. Why aren't we doing better? It's the challenge of 1 Peter. Not to those living in 21st century comfortable America, to those who are foreigners, refugees, scattered away from their nation of birth, scattered away from their motherland, scattered away from the promised land. Now they're foreigners being picked on by others who are all uh, under the Roman Empire. And he's like, yeah, I know it's tough. Grow up, deal with it. Do better. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I wish for a moment we could see the apostles of the Lamb come and minister to the United States of America. I wish we could telecast that and see how they would address us. I don't think it would be pretty. Verse 21, we got four verses left. New Living Translation still. Through Christ you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope And I want you to see both. Faith is now. Hope is expectation. Faith is what I believe now. Expectation is what I expect to come in the future. You've placed your faith and hope in God because you raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. And that's one thing about the gospel. It must be obeyed. And obedience keeps us clean. Obedience to the word, obedience to the truth keeps us clean. Disobedience results in filth. Disobedience to God's word, disobedience to God's standard, disobedience to God's laws, it results in filth. Sure, there are different amounts of filth. I don't want any filth. So let's be as obedient as we can. You were cleansed from your sins When you obey the truth, King James says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. I like that translation better because it means a constant obedience to God's word keeps my soul clean. And I like the distinction. One, again, it's the dynamic equivalence of the New Living Translation trying to give us the heart of it. I like the literal translation of the King James. I keep my mind, my will, and my emotions pure through the raw obedience to God's word. Because God's word commands me to obey. It doesn't ask how my mind feels. It doesn't ask how my feelings feels. It doesn't ask what my wills want. It just says, obey. And I say, yes, Lord, we will obey. And it keeps me clean. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. Here's a command written to brothers and sisters. In this local church, we have to fulfill this. We must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. In light of our Sunday mornings on forgiveness, who in our local congregation do you still struggle to be around? Who in our local congregation is on your Rolodex of grumbling and bitterness? And what will you do to make it right with them? I would hate to think somebody in my Rolodex of friends or acquaintances, somebody in there produces a bitterness in my heart that hurts my marriage or my kids. I would hate to think me rolling through the Rolodex, getting to Marlon's face and going, that that right there, I would hate for that to keep my kids sick. And it will. I would hate for that to keep my marriage broken. And it can. I recognize that maybe if you come from a place of hostility and a lot of betrayal and a lot of harm and trauma, It can be very hard to forgive and very hard to trust. And I'm not telling you to trust everybody, but I'm also telling you you don't have permission to to be paranoid. You don't have permission to be angry at the drop of a hat. 
If you were loved freely growing up, it's easier to love everybody. If you were given love or accolades or praise begrudgingly, it's very hard to trust and share your life with people. But if you're born again, you can drop down all those walls and open up your heart to people and love. And I'm telling you, love feels good. Caring for people feels good. Believing the best of people feels good. Being able to come to church and not fear who you might run into here is such freedom. I would hate to come to church and, and have to come on edge because so-and-so might be there this morning. And I might have to come in a little bit late and leave a little bit early lest we run into each other in the hallway or at the kids wing sign in or God forbid we have to use the bathroom together. Come on. This verse says, love each other deeply with all your heart. That's your command. If you can't do it yet, take that verse and say, God, how can I love each them or her with a fervent heart? Because your word's requiring it of me. I don't think I can do it, Lord. Well, verse 23 says, for you've been born again. So that means you're without excuse. You can do it. I'm going to read now out of the King James. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. The word of God is that incorruptible seed that caused us to be born again. The word of God, which lives and abides forever. That's our seed. You and I were born initially of corruptible seed. Our dad's zygote or sperm. That's corrupt. It's not corrupt just because of the sin nature. It's corrupt because it's a, it's a living cell that would die in a very short order. That, that made us naturally the first time. But when we were begotten again into a lively hope, we were begotten again with incorruptible seed. That is the word of God. That's the word that's been sown into us. That's the word that made us new creatures in Christ. That's the seed that now grows to produce great fruit for God. And one of those fruit is self-control. Work on it, church. What a way. Well, that's a good way to start the new year. Pray self-control. Pray self-control. Pray self-control. Get your appetites under control. Verse 24 this ends up sounding like James does at the end of chapter one or the middle part of chapter one. Remember, James talks about to those scattered abroad in the diaspora. And Peter starts off to the strangers scattered abroad. And now it says, for all flesh is as grass. James says the same thing. I'll read it to you real quick. James one says, um, let the rich... Rejoice that he's made low because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away for the soon. The sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withers the grass and the flower there fa falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. And this says for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower there falls away. Quoting the same passage in Isaiah. I'll read it to you, the New Living Translation. People are like grass. <laughs> What an encouraging word. I thought we were sheep. Not right now, you're not people, you're grass. Grass feels like it's dumber than sheep. Yes, it is, much dumber than sheep. People are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades away. But the word of the Lord remains forever. It's a reference to say, our body's going to die. The seed of our Father that created our biological body will fade. But the seed of our Father, God Almighty, that created us as a new creature in Christ will never fade away because we've been begotten again into a lively hope. The word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. That word is the good news that was preached to you. So a couple of things we see here as we wrap up. We see another epistle written to Christians in a very tough condition. They are now immigrants. They've been scattered abroad, which means they've uprooted their lives, their families, their businesses. They're in another land. They're not speaking uh, Hebrew. They're probably speaking Aramaic, maybe Latin, obviously some Greek. Uh, so they're outsiders trying to make a go at it in a huge region that is Turkey. 
and they're being persecuted. There's no evidence that they're being persecuted by the Roman government, but they're certainly being persecuted by the people whose towns and villages they've moved into, and now they are the outsider. They're being treated as, with a xenophobic distrust. And Peter doesn't give them a whole lot of encouragement. He says, don't forget, it gets better. Don't forget, you have eternal life. Don't forget that you still got to be obedient. Don't forget that you can't go back to the old way of living. He just keeps calling them for it. Yeah, I know it's rough. Go with God. I know it's tough. Press on for Jesus. I know it's tough, but you're born again. You don't see a lot of sympathy given to them because these things must be. He says, look at, look at it on the bright side. This is the trial of your faith. And where you're squeaking, you need the oil of the Holy Ghost. So squeak all you want, but please quickly get some oil so you can shut that thing up. Amen. All right. Please continue to pray for me as we travel through uh, more of northwestern uh, Saudi Arabia. And I'll send you guys a video for Sunday. We'll be traveling Sunday. And then I think Tuesday, so after Sunday, Obviously, I'll be headed to Albania to preach there for Pastor Fatmir, and we'll be there ministering several days in two or three churches and a Bible school, I think. Pray for me. Pray for our travels. Pray that God would speak to me, show me some things. Um, I'm very excited because by now I've gotten to have seen some biblical plants that we wrote about in the botany book, and they're in northwest Saudi Arabia, which is also the ancient land of Midia. There are several plants from the botany book, Phoenix dactylifera, Ritamoreatum, uh, Oleo europea, Ficus caricus, uh, what others? Yeah, Acacia radiana, or the broom tree, date palm tree, olive tree, fig tree, Acacia. Hopefully we'll get to see some Orobanch, Cronada. That'd be really cool too. Pray for me. I'm so honored to get to go, and I'm honored that you're here. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Let me pray for you, and I'll turn it over to whoever is closing this service out. Father, thank you for my church. Thank you for this body of believers. I ask you to bless them. Make your face to shine upon them. Thank you for helping the elders oversee things. Bless my wife as she ministers Sunday morning. Father, bless all the workers and all the visitors. Thank you for your word helping us. Be glorified in our lives and help us to press on and to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you all. We'll see you uh, on the next video or something. God bless.